日本の皆様こんにちは私たちはパリで開催されていますインターナショナルフォーラムオンクオリティオブアンドセーフティの学会に大阪から参加しております本日は私たちのリモートパティシペーションプログラムとしましてこちらにおられます2人の先生方をお招きいたしまして医療の安全におけるレジリエンスアプローチについてディスカッションをしたいと思いますどうぞご覧ください Hello, this is a remote participation program of International Forum on Quality and Safety 2012 for Japanese healthcare professionals. In this session, we are talking about resilience organization or resilience approach to safety. So I am Kazue Nakajima, Director of the Department of Clinical Quality Management, Osaka University Hospital. So today, we have three panels here. Let me introduce all of them very briefly. So first, Dr. Eric Hallnagel. He is professor, Institute of Public Health, University of Southern Denmark. Hello. Hello. Then, uh, Dr. Joran Henriks. He is the chairman of the International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare Strategic Advisory Board. And he is also the director of learning and innovation, Jönköping County Council, Sweden. Hello. And here, uh, she's my colleague from Osaka University Hospital, Dr. Ryoko Takahashi. Hello. Hello. So shall we start? Yes. Mm -hmm. So Professor Hallnagel, you came to Japan to give your lecture about resilience organization to airline professionals three years ago. I had the chance to attend the conference. At that time, the concept of resilience was quite new to Japanese people. And then they realized that they liked the, the idea, they really liked the idea of resilience engineering or resilience organization. You have just spoken to the Quality and the Safety Forum here at Paris about resilience healthcare. Can you explain to us what resilience approach means in relation to safety in general? Yes, I'll, I'll try to. It's, uh, as you said, this is really the intention to apply resilience engineering principles to healthcare. Resilience engineering as a discipline started about the year 2000, so about 10, 12 years ago, and was proposed as an alternative to conventional safety thinking mm -hmm. uh, because it was felt that in many industries we could not come further with conventional ways of thinking about safety and, and basically what resilience engineering tries to do is to understand how things work and understand how things go well and try to promote that because if something goes right then it cannot fail at the same time. So that is the, the very simply put the idea of resilience engineering and it was felt uh, quite soon that it could be applied in many different fields we had from the beginning uh, doctors involved in the resilience engineering group and then uh, a couple of years ago and we started more deliberately to look at resilience engineering applied to healthcare systems together with with their doctors and nurses primarily from from Sweden and from Canada in the first case and then we found it natural to formulate it as resilient healthcare, uh, in, because it is shorter than saying resilience engineering in healthcare. So we try to say resilient healthcare. And the idea is really to look at healthcare from the view of understanding why things work uh, and try to find ways of improving the way things work. Uh, both with regard to safety and with regard to quality for that matter. See, 
Um, as you already touched on this, um, but could you rephrase uh, what the major difference is between conventional patient safety approach and resilience approach to safety? Yes, thank you. The, uh, well, the, basically the, the, the difference is that conventional safety approaches in healthcare and in other industries focus on things that go wrong. They focus on accidents, on incidents and near misses, and they try to understand them in terms of failures or, or malfunctions, either in equipment or in humans or in organizations. And the idea is that you, if you can, from an accident, can determine the cause as something that failed, then the way to avoid accidents in the future is to eliminate the cause. Because then, in, in that kind of thinking, then if you eliminate the cause, then the consequence will not happen. Uh, this is an old, old way of thinking that it, it, it is uh, probably thousands of years old. Uh, and it has been very effective until about 30 or so years ago. Uh, it's a very effective as long as the systems we deal with are simple enough so that we can understand what's going on. But what we have seen in many fields, and in including healthcare, is that because uh, demands rise, because production pressures rise, because uh, the technology becomes more complicated, because time pressures increase, uh, that the whole operation becomes more and more difficult to understand and, and to, to really see through, which means that the simple approach of trying to find causes for accidents no longer uh, can apply. Instead, we have to understand not why things fail, but why things work. So in resilient healthcare, the emphasis is not on looking at what goes wrong, uh, as we have in incident reports or accident reports and try to find the cause of that or the root cause of that. But the emphasis in, is instead in looking at everyday work and trying to understand how it functions and why it functions. The, the reason for emphasizing this is that we must accept that everyday work is successful not because people can follow instructions and procedures to the letter, but because they can adapt and adjust instructions and procedures intelligently to match the situation. It is this variability that is the reason why things go wrong, but it is also this variability that is the reason why things sometimes, or most of the time, go right. Thank you. Uh, that idea, um, I think, it encourages us to struggle with patient safety again because we have been chuckled with instant accident all the time. So this idea is quite new and very um, encourages us. So, Yorand, uh, what are your thoughts on this matter? Do you have any sp specific yes. comments? Can, if I can start from a very simple example. Mm -hmm. um, when I first tried to learn how to play golf, mm -hmm. I had a golf coach that was standing close to me and every time the ball didn't go the direction that he predicted it should go, he was complaining on me and saying, now you're stiff in this shoulder, now I'm stiff in this shoulder, now I do not tip, look at the ball mm -hmm. in the correct way and stay uh, with my focus. Uh, it was very hard to learn how to play golf. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I started to uh, hesitate if I ever could, could learn the sport. Mm -hmm. But then I got a new coach that told me that the most important thing is to relax and see the wholeness of what you're doing, mm -hmm. but also vision where you are aiming with your ball and see the ball reach that aim. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it was much easier to play golf. <laughs> now, we have in, in daily care uh, 
roles or professions that are experts in this. For example, occupational therapists mm -hmm. that really try to search after the assets that the patient have or the, the, the skills that is possible for that patient to do. But um, occupational therapists are a rather new work in care mm -hmm. <laughs> and we are still dominated by the old, more risk analytic approach that the nurses and the doctors have from their previous education approach. Mm -hmm. And therefore it takes some time, but I'm very positive that this will develop a lot. And uh, uh, one sign of that is that we talk more about how to prevent or how to stay healthy instead of treating illness. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Oh, thank you very much for giving us a very <laughs> simple and understandable uh, example about um, no. goal playing practice. So I'm very, uh, I'm feeling positive to look at the positive side of human performance in daily basis, including evaluations. So um, again, Eric, um, can you give us some examples uh, from industry where this resilience approach has been particularly successful? Yes, uh, I, can, I can give you some examples of industries that are uh, adapting that approach, trying, uh, basically adapting, trying to understand the variability of performance and trying to anticipate what the variability could be so you're prepared for that when it happens because if you're prepared for something, then of course you can respond much faster and much more effectively. And uh, one example, uh, some, one industry I'm working with uh, now is uh, air traffic management, air traffic control, where we have a, a long collaboration and trying to bring these ideas in, into practice in several companies. Uh, I have uh, had the opportunity to work with the offshore companies in, in Norway, and they're very interested in the in the performance of, and work on oil platforms, obviously because we have seen uh, the major accident with the Deepwater Horizon uh, and of course everybody is interested in trying to avoid that. But they're not only interested in trying to avoid accidents, they're also trying to interest, interest in seeing how you can improve the work in, of course, so you can be more productive and, and avoid surprises. A third example uh, is uh, a large international company uh, that in, in, in the, their part in the US that deals with uh, the big power turbines that you use to generate electricity for, for factories and cities in the preparation and planning of the maintenance of these uh, pieces of equipment, which is a very, very complex uh, process and a, and a process that's different every time. Even though it's maintenance, it's always different because these are huge, huge machines that are all slightly different. And in addition, of course, we have uh, a lot of interest and a lot of work in, in healthcare, mainly in Canada and in Sweden at the moment, but, but we have uh, in contact with people from other countries as well. And, and uh, I can see, I, I hear from other people that they're interested in the ideas and, and uh, tell me about how they succeed and the problems they have also, of course. I see. So, um, so Eric, again, um, where has the resilience healthcare approach worked in patient safety? So you've been working for many uh, other industries and then now you have started to work with healthcare professionals. Is there any successful areas or implementation areas in patient safety? Yes, we have. Uh, we have uh, in Denmark where I work now, we have been looking for instance at uh, first of, of incidents uh, with the purpose not of understanding the individual incidents, but looking at across incidents to see what is the variability of what happens there, what are the conditions that, that happen there, 
Right now, I can say we are looking at, at the case. This was a very dramatic case where there, where there was a, a, a patient attacked some uh, a doctor and some nurses at, at the psychiatric hospital. But we're, what we're looking at is not the case itself has happened. What we're trying to look at, what is the daily procedure? What is the everyday procedure? And what is the variability of the every, everyday procedure? Because that is a better basis for understanding how this unfortunate event could happen. Uh, other hospitals have been looking at, at, the, uh, at the practice of preparing medication and so on, and, and trying to look at the everyday practice and, and how that happens and trying to learn from that. There have been, as I mentioned in my presentation here, there have been some studies in the UK that, that actually try to look at that and see positively how can you learn from what people do right. And, and I think the, the essential point in, in much of this is that we start to look at things not when something happens, but in everyday situation when, when we normally would say, well, nothing has happened. And normally we say, well, nothing has happened, why look at it? But we would, we would say, well, nothing has happened, and that's why we should look at it. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, the resilience approach um, comprises many parts, but the observation part is really important. That it is the um, observation part, the being paying attention to what you do, being aware of what actually happens, and instead of hurrying, hurrying to the next job and the next job and the next job to reflect a little on why did this work. I see. So Yoran, uh, you are a member of the Resilience Healthcare Network. So. Uh, Perhaps you're quite interested in this area. So um, do you have thoughts on how we could apply this approach in healthcare areas specifically? Do you have ideas? When I hear your dialogue, I'm thinking of uh, one example from our open care work where we have uh, tried to um, improve the performance in diabetes care. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we have seen that there is a, a large variation uh, over Sweden how well the diabetes patients are treated mm -hmm. uh, and found that um, uh, some practices or care centers are superior and when we study what they are doing they are applying actually this thinking from the beginning together with the customer or the patient then. So they write to the patient every uh, time they should come for a yearly uh, control and then they describe the process that they, gonna, that they invite the patient to. And, uh, that starts with we are so uh, it's time to meet and you're very warm welcome but after that it comes and when you now come we want to have these five things in place mm -hmm. and uh, we appreciate if you uh, can uh, collaborate with us to get these five uh, things in place and then of course there is an ending if you don't can't come and so on mm -hmm. so the, the, the absolute best practices, they then have the patient as the evaluator if these five things come in place. So they take an active part. Mm -hmm. And we see that the uh, care centers that have less good results, they always miss one or two of these things. Mm -hmm. So we now try to design uh, the work processes thinking in what we call bundles. Mm. So uh, nothing is ready before we have done all the things. Mm -hmm. That is uh, maybe in a historical engineering approach uh, not productive enough because you want to speed up everything you do. But if you look at it, <laughs> it is so much more productive because you don't have to do uh, a second meeting or call the patient back to your center because you didn't get one of the tests in place and so on. And we do this now in, um, in uh, colon cancer care where we have um, 
program that is called ERAS, Enha Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, that contain 28 different things that should be in place <laughs> every time. And that changed the uh, care days at the hospital for this uh, patient group. So instead of being between seven and nine days after operation for a colon cancer, they can go home after four to five days. And that is because we look into how should it look when it works? Mm. I see. I thank you very much for very nice examples, uh, including diabetes care and the colon cancer treatment. So is, is that the case in hospital care or a GP practice setting? Yeah, so the diabetes is in the GP yeah. setting mm -hmm. and the colon cancer yeah. then is from the hospital. Okay, so. uh, I see. So real go now, you have a many problems about the <laughs> implementation of things. So yeah. could you? Uh, I have one practical question. Um, it is quite encouraging to know that this looking into what goes well works. But at the same time, we have this culture back in the hospital that the good process, the process that worked well is invisible. And my question is, how can we have the eyes to look into these good processes, processes that work well, and where to start? <laughs> <laughs> a, I, I think it, it, to me it's very much a question of opening your mind, so to speak. You, you say very correctly that we don't pay attention to things that go well. Uh, there is a psychological mechanism called habituation, which means that if things are repeated, uh, like a sound is repeated or so on, then after a while we don't hear it anymore. We, we habituate it, we become used to it. And it's the same with, with uh, activities, things that go right, uh, uh, are all similar in the sense they go right, and it's only the things that go wrong that stand out, that are different. And psych psychologically, we as human beings and as animals as well, pay attention to that which is different from the rest. But that's where we have to use our willpower and our intelligence to say, no, we should also look at that which does not go wrong, exactly that which goes right, and try and understand why it goes right. I know there is some reluctance to that because, uh, as you indicate, people say, well, if it goes right, then it goes right, and let's get on and do something else. But I think there are many examples from, from businesses and industry that show that if you pay attention to that, if you make an effort now in understanding what you do well, then you will do better in the future. So the investment that you make, make now comes back. Whereas if you don't make the investment, then you don't improve. You may still be doing things, but you don't improve, and you may get some very nasty surprises. Joko, are you okay with that, the, that answer? Yes. Additional questions? Yes, thank you very much. Um, Joran, um, what are your comments on capturing invisible successful processes or performances? Any comments on that? I think that there are many ways to help people, but uh, uh, too often our daily work are so forced by uh, reaching the daily demands uh, quick enough so I can go home or I can do something else. So then I look too much into how I put in my hands into a process instead of seeing the customer's process or the patient's process. So to start with, I think a good dialogue at all working places is what can we see that the patients see? Mm -hmm. So we see their journey through our system. Mm -hmm. It starts there and if we have that dialogue and can really take the customer's perspective, mm -hmm. then we are 
have done the first most challenging thing that we look at things from a different view. Mm, I see, thank you. So um, I would like to continue this session, but <laughs> time is running out. I think this is a very good start for us to try to implement the resilience approach to patient safety in our healthcare settings. So thank you very much, all of you, um, for sharing your professional knowledge and experience. So I deeply appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very thank, much. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.